And we are the Coalition, loud and proud, outrage porn free, civilly disobedient media broadcasting live on the worldwide Coalition Network here at the Go Local Live Broadcast Center, deep in the heart of the city we so love, Providence, Rhode Island, the naked city of about, well, 365,000 stories. Facebook.com slash The Coalition Radio on the Mighty Mighty Twitter at Coalition underscore radio. And of course, the mothership, CoalitionRadio.us, where our blog section has essentially become a, a reporting line for the American Civil Liberties Union, given everything that's going on here in Rhode Island and nationally. And there are links to our podcast site at Spreaker. You can also find us at Spotify, as well as iHeartRadio. And, of course, a link to our YouTube page. It's been a difficult, crazy week here in Providence. The school, I call it the school hostage crisis, that is, the children of Rhode Island who are being held hostage by our failed school systems, continues to take place in Rhode Island. The new interim school administrator, statewide, is making noises now that she's going to control the contract and, and virtually every aspect of life in the Providence City School System. We'll wait and see how that goes. This week was also a difficult week for families here in Rhode Island. We're well acquainted with the fact that the Nairobi folks, the Pete, Ron, Nick of Cardi's Brothers fame, lost one of their family members. Another family, however, also had a loss of someone who's a patriarch of one of Rhode Island's great business. Of course, I'm talking about Mr. Bill Scavato of Yacht Club Soda. If you listen to the show, you know they're no stranger to us and they're no stranger to Rhode Island. They've been part of the everyday lives of Rhode Islanders for over 100 years. As a family, they took over the business decades ago from the founder. And they've worked successively through generations to bring you, well, as we love to say here in Rhode Island, the boutique soda of Rhode Island before even Rhode Island knew it needed a boutique soda. Long before we were hipsters, or in my case, a palimentation of such. They're a wonderful family who become part of life, if you will, in North Providence. Their family extends across several businesses. And as a state, we're better for them. Because they bring to the state everything great about, well, Rhode Island. They're entrepreneurs. They own businesses. They invest in the state. They hire Rhode Islanders. They pay penny, plenty of taxes. Oh, my God. Their business has been under assault somewhat for the last few years by the, the state of Rhode Island in their never-ending quest to, to nationalize every aspect of our life, but that's time, a different time for that type of story. But I just wanted to expend my heartfelt condolences to the Zambato family. John, his son, is a regular on this show and has contributed greatly not only in sponsoring the show but also in participating in the civic life that surrounds this show in the state of Rhode Island. Rhode Island would be a poor place without families like this Gambato family. And I want to thank them for their support and wish them nothing but Godspeed in the challenging days ahead as, as they move forward, as we know they will. We've got quite a lineup tonight. A subject that is part and parcel of, well, virtually two out of every three broadcasts from the coalition, of course, is the conversation surrounding the decriminalization of sex work. For anyone who's listening to the show for the first time or listens to it in the future, Rhode Island at one point, not that long ago, was on the vanguard, if you will, of, well, a society where at least at some level folks could engage in consensual acts where commerce might be involved, without fear of imprisonment, persecution, criminalization, all the ills that come away with the stigmatization of, well, a part of a life that's been with us, well, since the beginning. We'll continue to handle this subject, the decriminalization of sex work, until society comes around and understands that this is a normal part of the human condition. And that by marginalizing folks who participate in it, who are participating in what is almost always a mutually consensual financial arrangement between two adults, until they're simply, well, left alone to pursue their own lives, follow their own hearts, and make their own decisions. So it is with great pleasure tonight that we bring yet another individual on 
a subject matter expert, if you will, on the issue, to join us through the miracle of, well, Skype audio. For the first time, we'd like to let, uh, excuse me, welcome Jesse Sage to the coalition. Jesse, thanks for coming on about board tonight. Yeah, you're welcome. Thanks for having me. So uh, Jesse comes to this with a variety of, of interests, if you will, a variety of levels of perspective and expertise. A writer, a philosopher, someone who is engaged in, in production of their own podcast, the Peep Show podcast, which we provided links for in the run-up to sh today's show. And you'll see links for afterwards when we produce the recording. But is also someone who is a professional within, if you will, the sex work industry. And what we've been trying to provide all along is a high degree of authenticity. There exists a, a few layers, if you will, within the movement that's pushing to decriminalize sex work. Of course, you've got the folks themselves who are actively engaged in the work. You've got folks who are, if you will, the consumers. You've got a very strong ally network of folks who are either academics, media types, activists like myself, who are doing whatever they can to amplify these concerns at a time when it would appear that the full force of government is being waged and weaponized against individuals who are often marginalized in terms of finances and resources. But my experience has been never marginalized in terms of spirit, guts, sheer physical will, integrity, and ability to articulate some of the most complicated issues facing the human condition. So when I had the opportunity to listen to our podcast and to see and to read some of our tweets at first, of course, that's always the hook, right? to analyze the conversation that she was having across all forms of media, whether it was involvement in the industry or so, I had to reach out to her and had to ask her to join us because she brings with her that authenticity that is so lacking in public media and the popular culture. So give us a little background. Just, you know, first of all, again, you, you host a podcast, you write, you, mm -hmm. you're an activist. At what point in time yeah. did, you, did you become involved and, and how did you... Uh, you know, come about to So my understanding is you started first as an academic and then gradually became involved in the industry itself. Kind of give us an introduction. Yeah, so I think I don't have a very traditional path. I didn't get into sex work until my late 30s, actually. So I was working in academia. I did, I was in a PhD program in feminist philosophy, and before that I did a master's degree in theology. And I was teaching theology and philosophy and women and gender studies, um, doing all of, um, a little bit of all of that. And um, I, in working, it's kind of impossible to work in feminist philosophy without hearing uh, a lot of opposition to the sex industry. So historically, particularly in second wave feminism, there's been a lot of critiques of starting with pornography, um, but the sex industry in general. And um, I didn't really intend to get into sex work, but um, I remember, you know, earlier in my career, um, when I was looking at sexuality, women's sexuality uh, in particular, and uh, female embodiment, which is what I worked on when I was working in philosophy, um, the things that people were, the things that feminist philosophers in particular were saying about the sex industry didn't really seem right to me. It seemed like too uh, narrow of a picture. And I ended up in, I, I ended up leaving my PhD program for a myriad uh, for myriad reasons, um, having to do with like exploitation in academia, <laughs> um, yep. and not in the sex industry, but in academia. And um, while I was working outside of academia, I um, started camming a little bit. I my partner actually is was working is also an academic, but he was working in a sex industry for me and he was doing a lot of camming and was writing a dissertation on webcam modeling and I was interested in what he was doing and thought that I would give it a try um, in part because I was curious like what that experience was like and in part because I heard a lot about um, pornography from outside of it but I didn't know that much about it from like an insider's perspective so the first thing that I did was I got into webcam modeling and I I didn't actually find like my fit there, although I did it for a couple of 
years like as a side hustle while I was doing other mm -hmm. jobs. But while I was doing that, I um, one of the one of the things that came out of that experience is that I got connected in with a sex with a community of online sex workers, um, which, like you said in your introduction, is a community that's full of very um, smart and articulate and socially conscious and uh, people, um, really amazing. Like they were doing work uh, in uh, bot in activism and in body. Uh, autonomy and uh, in intimacy work that was so much richer, I thought, than what most of the academics that I knew was doing. So that was kind of my entry. And then after a while, I ended up in my primarily, the things I primarily do now are phone sex and I also do um, video, like um, um, I, videos. Um, and so that's what I've been doing. I mean, that's been kind of my entry into sex work. But um, in the process of all of that, I also ended up starting a swap chapter at, in Pittsburgh and mm -hmm. doing um, the podcast that we do, which is very focused on news and stories coming out of the sex industry. And, um, and I also started working as a writer, doing public writing outside of academia, like in that time period. So it's kind of how I ended up here. I didn't really expect to get into this line of work or for it to become such a career for me, but mm -hmm. that's what's ended up happening. So uh, let, let's reflect on that a little bit. First of all, the question that I, I always ask, and you know, for a lot of folks this is an uncomfortable one because so many of their, for lack of a better term, prejudices and bigotries are based on this. At any time in your career, you know, and essentially morphing from a full-time academic to someone who has an academic pursuit while actively a member of the sex worker community, were you coerced, right. forced, um, challenged? Uh, did someone hold a gun to you to do the, any of this? <laughs> no. Uh, <laughs> no. Okay. Uh, no, never. <laughs> never. <laughs> I don't even know who that person would be that would do that. Right. And, 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 and we've had, as the, in, in, right in line with the national statistics, and I'm talking about the real statistics, not the ones that are sort of conjured up, invented, massaged, prevaricated. I'm, coming, I'm running out of synonyms here. But uh, in, in, <laughs> I have yet, in the dozens of folks that I've interviewed, on this show who work in a variety of capacities in a variety of different aspects within the sex work community from folks who are escorts to uh, fetish to uh, folks who do cam work, folks who do videos. I have yet to meet or talk to a single person who has even been slightly coerced into doing this. Now that's, that's not to say that people use this as an economic alternative to some very challenging circumstances, but... sure. It's always been a choice for people. So because... Yeah, I mean, I don't know that I can't say that because within activism circles, we, de we definitely have people who've survived, um, mm -hmm. you know, childhood abuse and trafficking. But I would agree with you in the sense, you know, and people who now are seeking out sex work under very different conditions. I mean, most people in sex work activism say that, you know, people enter into sex work for you know, a variety of different reasons ch that fall under the rubric of choice or coercion or economic necessity, right? And so there's different reasons that people enter into it. But I think that you're totally right to point out that the vast majority of the people who are working in the sex trades of all sorts are there because it's the most it's the best choice for them given the ch options that they have. Absolutely, that's great. Which means that they've entered into it for mm -hmm. reasons that are of their own choosing. Right. Now, let's tell you, you brought up an interesting point. You know, you, you reached out and you've described this entire range of activities. Talk about the entrepreneurial aspect of, of sex work and the control, and perhaps less so given federal legislation the last year or so, but the overall level of control that you have now over yourself, your, your economic prospects, and quite frankly, your body that may not exist everywhere. Yeah, I mean, I, I can speak pretty directly to that because I, while I've been doing 
sex work, I've also been working as an adjunct, you know, professor. And adjunct professors is really, it's a be, it's very contingent labor. Um, and mm -hmm. you don't actually know if you're going to be teaching the next semester. And you certainly don't get paid over the summer or when you're not working. Um, and you don't get paid for any of the extra things that you do, like mentoring and things like that. And at the end of the you know, at the end of every semester when other people who are in my position are stressing out because they're not sure how they're going to make ends meet over the summer, you know, that's far less stressful to me who's like, oh, well, I'll just fall back on the work that I'm doing in the sex industry because that's always something that I can pick up from wherever I am. I already have created, like, avenues for revenue within the lines of sex work that I do. So, it creates a um, a freedom in that sense that once other forms of labor are not available for whatever reason, there's always a way in which you can pick up um, from wherever you are and make money in uh, in sort of their erotic labor, uh -huh. do erotic labor to make money. So to a large degree, it's actually somewhat ironically afforded you a level of freedom to, as they would have said, in the 14th century, follow your muse. I mean, you, you are able to pursue right. a variety of projects you might not have been able to if you had to go to the you know, conventional nine-to-five job. Absolutely, and it's also allowed me to write. I mean, I think that one of the things that people also don't want to talk about is the fact that freelance writers, columnists, people who do the sort of work that I do, those aren't high-paying jobs. Right. I mean, they're... But they're very creative and they're interesting work. And the reason that I can continue to write in the way that I do is because that's subsidized by sex work. Mm -hmm. And so um, there's an entire range of career alternatives that you have because of your lifestyle. Right, yeah, that I wouldn't be able to do if I thought I was going to try to make a living just by freelance writing without having anything else that could subsidize that. And I know so many sex workers who are in the same position, who are artists and writers and creatives of all sorts, who um, who are able to follow those sorts of career paths because they also do sex work. And the other thing about that, too, is it's not just that you can do the sort of creative work because you're doing sex work. It's also that sex work is created in and of itself. You know, there's so much that you, so many skills that you employ as a sex worker, um, per, you know, there's marketing and uh, branding and video editing and creation of art and all of that is also encompassed within the job. So for creative people who have creative pursuits that aren't sex work, um, it helps to subsidize that, but also the work itself is creative and interesting, much more so than any of the, you know, nine to five jobs that I've had. Right. And, and which it, I've had many. No, I would. <laughs> Haven't we all? Uh, and, and, you know, ultimately, so much of sexuality is psychological. So much of it is telling a story or creating a story. And to a degree particular that I found with, with folks who work in the, in, the, in the sex trade professionally, that a great deal of the draw, the energy that they have is actually following the psychology, the head games, the, you know, all that surrounds sexuality, and far less so than the physical side. Particularly, in oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah. I mean, I think something about this work, and this is what I. It's funny that you say that because I remember, you know, I've come at this from somebody who used to study a lot, who was an academic, and when I was doing that work, I, you know, I spent the first couple of, I don't know, I would say after a month in um, doing phone sex in particular, because that's a very that's a particularly heady sort of area of, of sex work um, because people are just describing their fantasies and their histories and their psychology and their desires in ways that you don't in more visual mediums. Um, they, I, I remember thinking that I learned more doing this job in a month about human sexuality than I did doing graduate studies in human sexuality. Um, mm -hmm. And feeling like almost feeling like that was a waste of time um, because the real learning that I did took place like on the job. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I, I, that's a great point because you also mentioned that earlier on. 
your work in working alongside of other folks on the creative and side of the sex industry, your, your explanation is that these folks were far more immersed, if you will, in the issues surrounding sexuality than anyone proctoring a course or, or you know, studying statistics from whether it be the FBI crime statistics or, or any sort of the case <laughs> studies or, or late night phone calls and, and interviewing people that that could possibly have. Yeah, I mean, people tell us a lot. <laughs> people tell us more than they tell their partners. They tell us more than they tell their, their friends, um, more than they tell researchers for sure. Um, because there's something kind of uh, sacred about that relationship, the relationship between provider and client. Um, I also, you know, it's interesting because I have friends who work as therapists and I've talked to them a little bit about um, my work in relationship to the work that they do. And even I, I've had therapist friends say to me that they wish that their clients would talk as openly with them about what they were going through as they did with us. And I think there's something really interesting about that. What, why do you suppose that is? I mean, are we still as a society, I mean, it's almost cliche to say that we're ashamed of, of our sexuality, but mm -hmm. everyone that I've spoken to in, in, the, in the industry essentially call it the hairdresser effect, if you will, you know, the salon effect. You, you say things, folks will tell you things that they wouldn't dream, ideas, discussions that they've suppressed from, in some cases, spouses of 20 years or more. I, 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 how, what is that dynamic? Right. Um, I think that there's a couple of things going on. I think one of them is that it's a low-stakes relationship. You know, you, you care a lot about the judgment of your spouse because your life is totally intertwined with theirs, you know. So mm -hmm. it's, it's the same sort of phenomenon as, like, that some philosophers, like Philip D'Souza, talk about intimacy with strangers, where he gives an example where he says that if you're on a plane with a stranger, for example, you'll tell them a lot about your life that you don't tell somebody else because you assume that you'll never see them again. You know, mm -hmm. so I, and that's certainly not true with sex workers. We see clients repeatedly, you know, but there's something about that distance that allows for an intimacy that I think is really important. You know, these aren't people who are part of your everyday life or inside your marriage or you're not trying to negotiate your job or your raising of your kids or anything else with them. So it's a space where you can just explore your sexual desires. Um, and, and it's a non-judgmental space where you right. can explore your sexual desires. Um, but I also think that there is something else going on, which is that... Um, we also occupy in society a stigmatized position, and I think that there's something, you know, disarming about that, for, for better or for worse, and I think most of it is worse. <laughs> you know, it's, it's actually really difficult to live under the stigma of sex work. That's one of the hardest things about the, the work itself. It's not the work itself, but dealing with that sort of stigma. But I think that, um, I think that, that also creates a space in which people feel like they can tell you things that they don't want to tell people in in their everyday vanilla life. Um, I also think that it's our job. We we also know a lot about human sexuality. So it's I, I found that the longer that I've done this job, the easier it is for me to get people to open up about what it is that they want because we have more of an innate understanding of that. Now, that's a long-winded answer. I don't know. No, no, no. That's, it, it's absolutely spot on. But at the same time, and, and without getting too personal for you per se, so let's project this question over not just yourself, but folks that you work alongside of, works, folks that you partnered with. Given a digital world, what you do, and particularly, in, say, in your case, or someone like you, let's, let's keep it independent, if you will. Someone like you, you, you publish, you write, you lecture, you talk, you appear in the media. So... You, in a sense, your activities have largely "quote unquote" outed you, and I hate that. I hate that term because folks will, folks will attach a stigma to that. And I don't mean that when I say right, out, right, right. Mm -hmm. And I, I mean, I say outed merely. You have a public persona that is immersed in your career as someone who is very sexual, at least in their career choice. Right. And and so, how invasive or how difficult does that make your your private life, if you will, and your your personal life with Folks who 
may not understand those choices. Yeah, I mean, it, it is difficult, and you're absolutely right. I, at one point, I made a decision. Um, there was a long period of time, and I think that most out-sex workers will talk about this, because you don't just start doing that work and then tell everybody about it, because there are a lot of negative consequences to that. Um, but I think that um, over, you know, there was a period of time in which I was not telling people about the work that I was doing, and then at some point, I mean, it, in my personal history in particular, um, it's because I started, I did a big, like, talk for the Pittsburgh Humanities Festival about masculinity and sex work, um, what sex workers know about masculinity. Um, and I did not expect that to be um, so heavily advertised, <laughs> if that makes any sense. Um, yep. I thought that I wanted to give this talk when I was asked to do it, and then I realized that it was going to be heavily advertised, and I had to think about if I'm willing to be that out or not. And then I just decided that I would. And the interesting thing about that for me is that doing that allowed me to take on other um, other public um, mediums. You know, I, I started to write for the uh, paper, and under my sex work persona, and I was able to do that because I was, was right. out about the work that I was doing. And so um, I think that it closed a lot of, I think it probably closed some doors um, because you can't undo that. You know, you can't take it away after you mm -hmm. made that um, apparent. So it's probably closed some doors, but on the other hand, it's given me opportunity to pursue some of the things that I've done. And also for me, um, at this point, because I'm already out, it's very, po it's, I feel like I have a political responsibility mm -hmm. um, and, and an ethical responsibility to, um, to voice the concerns of sex workers since I have the ability to do that, right. um, which obviously I don't, I can't speak for everybody and everybody's experience and I don't do that. But what I can do is, um, advocate and amplify um, the concerns of sex workers where I can. And um, and so for me, it's been important to use the fact that I'm out to, right. in so, the best way that I possibly can, and, and, you know, and, in the most um, useful way for the community. Right. No, it, because it, not everybody can be out. You know, not everybody right. can be out. There's a lot of consequences to that. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of, you know, families out, like ostracized people. Uh, I've done a lot of work on motherhood and sex work and a lot of writing on motherhood and sex work because mm -hmm. I am a mother, and that's one of the biggest concerns is mothers, uh, is, you know, custody issues, and I've, I've been lucky I don't have issues with that. But, um, but yeah, I mean, I think that... Um, that there's a lot of people that can't be out and that it's not safe for them to be out. And so I think for those of us who can be, um, it's important to use that uh, to amplify the voices and the concerns of the sex work community. How, how much of a sense of freedom did it give you once, in fact, you finally just let go and became, if, if you will, not just, some, not just Jesse Sage, the, you know, the someone who was involved in, in sex work and, and, and the academic side of it, but someone who became a powerful voice uh, in Pittsburgh for this. I mean, that must have been a, a, an amazing feeling. It, it is amazing, but at the same time, I have to, like, recognize my own privilege. You know, I'm an educated white woman, mm -hmm. um, and so there's things that I can do that you know, I'm, a, I'm also a cis woman, you know, so I'm an educated white cis woman, and I could... It was freeing for me, <laughs> but I know that, uh, you know, not everybody has that experience. So. Right. But, but you're, yeah, you're, I mean, to, to your point, um, I actually had a corporate job um, mm -hmm. for a while, and I got laid off of my corporate job, and they called me in, and, and at this time I was kind of living a double life, you know, and they called me in, and they're like, we're very sorry, this is a, you know, and they were trying to apologize to me, and I was so excited because at that moment I was like, I'm free. <laughs> Right. I can just go and do my thing. <laughs> but right. I couldn't say that. I was just, you know, trying to hide my smile as I, like, walked out the door. <laughs> right. It, 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 it's interesting because I do believe that, that white privilege exists. And on the other yeah. hand, if you're able to channel 
that privilege into a form of activism and a responsibility, if you will, and you may not even realize you've assumed it, but in a sense, we, anyone who's an activist has, to, to use that ability to challenge authority and to challenge status quo. And it sounds cliched, but to, 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 to use that for good, if you will, instead of just evil or self-absorption, I, I think is tremendous. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, you, you, there, there's things that in my activist life that I can say to figures of authority, uh, whether it be police, uh, governors, senators, whatever, simply because, as I get away with, and, and my, a lot of my friends kid me about it, simply because I'm a middle-aged white guy who looks more like your neighborhood insurance broker than someone who is, you know, holds by what some would say controversial beliefs. Um, and, and so right. you, you use the power, use, use it for what you can, and, and, and be that person that, you know, helps raise the tide for, for everyone, including people who are marginalized, you know, particularly on, on income issues and family issues, who simply don't have the option. They have the desire, they have the skills, but life circumstances, well, as we all know, are going to be pretty, pretty right. complicated. So use it while you can. I, you know, it, it's, uh, it's, I think it should be a point of personal pride that, uh, that you're willing to confront these issues, issues head on. Folks, if you're just joining us, Jesse Sage, and I'm going to give out some links now on Twitter. She is at, at Sapio Textual, and of course her website is jessiesage.com as she's joining us. She is a writer, a philosopher, an active sex worker in the sex work community. She's a community organizer in, in Pittsburgh, uh, one of the organizers of something called SWAP. Uh, so again, and I'm going to have you talk about that in a minute because we've had a variety of folks in from different chapters of SWAP on the show. Um, she's an ex-biz nominated clip producer if, in the industry. That's uh, one of the, one of, if you will, one of the, if the, some have said it's kind of like the Wall Street Journal of the sex business, if you will. <laughs> but it, but, but it, let's remember, folks, for all the f people who hear this and might turn it off in a second or two because, oh my God, they're talking about sex. Here in the city of Providence, sex is a multi, multi-million dollar industry and in many cases owned and propagated by some of the wealthiest, most connected people in town. Nationally, it's a multi-billion dollar industry, which means you may not think you're watching porn or you may not be engaging in it, but probably a whole lot of people that you think you know really well are. <laughs> so it's, it's there, it's everywhere. And what we're talking about tonight are issues, the continue issues around post-FOSTA, post-SESTA, uh, post-increased criminalization, post stigmatization post you know, the removal of electronic, uh, if you will, the freedoms that, that allowed folks to operate in a safe, mature manner. We're talking about some of the issues that are facing different people with different perspectives. Now, you, you're in Pittsburgh. We talked about a little bit offline about this. Um, short of a certain Jennifer Beals movie from the 1980s, I traditionally wouldn't, <laughs> you know, and I will not ever... <laughs> do a, uh, as someone tried to get me to once do, I'm a, a, the, the Maniac song on karaoke night. I, you know, <laughs> I know the words, that's all I'm saying. But, you know, quite frankly, you know, we, we don't think of Pittsburgh as, or Cleveland, or any of these other, you know, Rust Belt, Midwest, you know, Bible Belt or Heartland style communities as bastions of sexuality. And yet, it's the human condition, isn't it? I mean, talk to me about what you do in terms of your writing. You, you work for an alternative paper. Uh, and your podcasting, but you know, is there any difference really between the Pits people of Pittsburgh and the people of well, maybe not the Lower East Side of Manhattan, but at least Midtown Manhattan? <laughs> <laughs> you know? um, yeah, I mean, one of the things that I think is interesting um, about sex work is that one of the things that the the internet has done is it's decentralized, particularly within like. Uh, pornography, which is, you know, my entry into sex work, but it's decentralized a lot of things. So while while you had to be in San Francisco and L.A. and Miami at one point in order to participate in uh, pornography or do any of the shoots because that's where the, the studios were centralized and all of the work was there, now with cam sites and clip sites and everything else, you it's possible for people who aren't on the on one of the coasts or who aren't in one of the major metropolitan cities to also be able to from their house you know engage in sex work i mean this is true of phone sex it's true of clip production it's clue i mean and obviously in every city there's escorting um so 
uh, in you know everywhere in the world. <laughs> so that that's always been taking place, but there's now a lot more people who are engaged in lots of different forms of sex work from all of the smaller cities as well, and um, and even more rural places. And because and this is what the tragedy of uh, living in a post foster sesta world is, is that all of those networks um, are being shut down. You know, I think, mm -hmm. um, so it's becoming more and more difficult for for independent clip producers and cam models to be able to make a living. But, um, but um, up until, you know, relatively recently, up until last year, um, it was... There, there is a lot of work going on, a lot of independent work going on in all of these places, and Pittsburgh is no exception to that. There's also a lot in Ohio. And um, we, as we were working, um, one of the things about um, sex work in these smaller cities is that a lot of people don't know, uh, don't have a community set up, you know, here. And only interact with other sex workers or the sex work community or the sex worker rights movements online. And so we thought it was important to have, to not only be engaged in sort of a national conversation, um, which we have been tapped, which I've been tapped into for a while, but to also start something more locally. And um, that we did about a year and a half ago, uh, me and, uh, um, a colleague of mine started the SWAT Pittsburgh chapter, and it's still small, but we're trying to to grow. And we've done several like big political campaigns in Pittsburgh um, that are specific to police pol policing in particular, like in the Pittsburgh area, policing of sex work. Right. Uh, and and for folks who aren't familiar with SWAP, it's the make sure I get the acronym right, Jesse. It's the Sex Worker Outreach Project, uh, which is a mm -hmm. sort of, sort of there's a national umbrella, if you will, of loosely uh, affiliated organizations in cities across America. And there's also something called SWAP Behind Bars, which is a wonderful group of, of folks who uh, work actively to help folks who, who've been incarcerated, uh, who are sex workers, and provide mm -hmm. them with financial. Re re uh, well, first of all, uh, the human touch, someone who is willing to reach out to them, whether it be by books or in actual contact, uh, some financial support, you know, uh, providing sort of a sense of love to folks who don't get a lot, um, you know, particularly once the system releases them out right back out into the world that they came from. Um, and so, right. so it's, it's, it's a great organization. There, uh, there are some national observances, which we've observed here on the show a couple of times a year. So it's an organization that if you're involved in sex work and you haven't reached out to uh, folks in your city, either, you know, through the miracle of the internet, find them or reach <laughs> out to folks and, and start to organize one because, you know, what we, we, we've been blessed here in Rhode Island. Bella Robinson and a other group of individuals attached to Brown University have really stepped up the level of conversation here in, in, in the city. We, we, Despite the fact that it's still a very, very challenging environment, um, it, it require and it requires a great deal of personal courage because, again, the minute you out yourself, there are folks who will, given the opportunity, use that air quotes against you. But right. it, it's only really going to be through aggressive political techniques that there is the level of criminal and civil justice accorded to the community uh, that, quite frankly, they deserve. Um, right. Mm -hmm. So, I, you know, I, one of the biggest challenges this year, astonishingly enough, um, where other c countries around the world, in fact, I just read a report where Thailand has cracked down on the ability of law enforcement to engage in sexual acts while actively engaging or investigating sex workers. Um, right. In many parts of the United States, despite what you may have seen on TV, on crime shows on TV, not only is it thoroughly legal, it's thoroughly common. And, and so, right. you know, the, uh, law enforcement is, uh, Leo, is, is right. And from no our perspective, friend. that's, that's rape. You know, sex under false pretenses right. is rape and should be called out as such. Mm -hmm. And, and it needs to be because yeah. w w I love your opinion on this. I want to see how this is impacting a city like P Pittsburgh and the larger cities here in the Northeast. You've got the growth of in my, my re references, uh, is using the same techniques as the war on drugs. You've got the growth of the 
I don't know, I'll call it the, the uh, anti-sexual freedom industrial, mo industrial movement. You've got these vast, right. highly funded organizations that uh, serve to trade on cliches and, and myths, truths, uh, earn enormous amounts of money while providing fewer, if any, services uh, at all in relation to the size of them. And at the same time, it, you know, they take a great deal out of the air out of the room and having a frank conversation. Uh, about it now is it right. does that exist as well in a, in a city like pittsburgh yeah i mean that that's a huge problem here and that's one of the things that we've been wanting to fight last summer not this summer but the summer of 2017 um we uh created a coalition to fight against um a, the fact that the city of uh, the city of pittsburgh police was using con condoms as instruments of crime so um, well, explain, so explain that. Feel in Pencil yeah, so in Pennsylvania, um, prostitution is a low-level misdemeanor. And so it's not even something that you can get like booked for. It's, a cita it's citation worthy. But what was happening and what was happening really, really frequently, and particularly with the most marginalized sex workers, is that um, undercover cops, vice cops, were setting up dates with... Um, with escorts, and then once they saw condoms, they were claiming that those condoms and cell phones, too, were instruments of crime. And instruments of crime move, bumps it up to felony charges, which you then get booked into, uh, into jail for. And they were doing that in order to obviously chump charges and get, and, um, you know, get pleas. Uh, so... Um, but the problem, so the problem with that uh, is is obvious, right? right? So it discourages condom use, and it also discourages cell phone use. So, and the law is a wild, like, misappropriation of what an instrument of crime is supposed to be. An instrument of crime is a weapon of some sort, or, right. you know, it's not... It's not a condom or a cell phone. Under that logic, a child carrying a backpack who shoplifts something, you could say that a backpack that they put the whatever they shoplift in as an instrument of crime, right? I mean, it just doesn't make any sense. And so um, what we did a couple of summers ago what, as SWAT Pittsburgh is we put together a coalition that included the ACLU and Planned Parenthood and a bunch of other lo local organizations as well uh, to talk about why... Uh, criminalizing condom use like that um, disincentivizes safer sex practices and also entraps sex workers. Um, also, I think it, it's worth noting that uh, particularly for trans um, folks that just having condoms on their person um, caused cops to claim that they were uh, sex workers, even if that's not what they were doing. So, um, so I think that uh, so so what ended up happening there is that they said that they would stop using condoms as instruments of crime because the public health because uh, it was very easy to make a public health uh, um, well, and, and, crime about that, but they're still mm -hmm. using cell phones, and so they're still using cell phones, and there's still nothing saying that they can't actually sleep with um, or have sex with people. As, and use that as evidence of a crime. So, mm -hmm. um, so there's still a lot of work to be to be done. And so, we, um, you know, that's that's kind of the climate that we have going on right now, and what we're trying to fight against. But you're absolutely right that there's nothing in Pittsburgh or in the state of Pennsylvania that says that cops aren't allowed to have sex with sex workers in order to collect evidence of crimes. Mm -hmm. um, and I think I, we all consider that to be rape, and and they're also using the safety mechanism, safety in terms of health, like condoms, and safety in terms of being able to make safe calls, um, cell right. phones, and creating really, really dangerous situations for sex workers in Pittsburgh. Yeah, and, and, and here's the real tragedy, because on a federal level, FOSTA and SESTA took a variety of activities that would be normal for anyone conflate them as a form of electronic uh, interaction, if you will, and as a result, rise, dramatically rise the level of, of the quote-unquote criminality, while at the same time, right. the, the I, you could say unintended, I'll, I'll challenge that in a different environment, 
But the unintended side effects in terms of public health have been to, in the same way that the war on drugs occurred, and the war on drugs, they, illegal, they made you know, possessing needles illegal in many areas. Well, you sure right. showed everybody because the level of HID expl HIV excuse me, exploded and people died because they, w they were so afraid of getting arrested for, for using drugs that, in fact, they shared needles. And, and with condoms, I mean, for the love of God and all that is holy in this world, in the year 2019, if you're going to do anything to discourage the use of condoms by people engaging in, cons in consensual sex acts, then there is a special place in hell for you, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, it, it, it's, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I, I, I just, it's, it's, it's so contrary to just being a human being that I, you don't know what to say after a while. You, you, you don't, right. under, you, you're, and I love your opinion on this. I mean, are these folks that challenged that they don't understand the issues, or are they intentionally trying to put people in harm's yeah. way? Yeah, I mean, when you said unintended consequences, my first thought was, no, they're absolutely intended. Uh, well, I, exactly. <laughs> I mean, that's why we use the, we call it the coalition air quotes. If you could see me now, I'd be doing the unanticipated, yeah, I, I, you, you, and yet, it's hard for folks. I mean, folks. the system is working as it's supposed to, and it's to criminalize sex, <laughs> to criminalize drugs, to criminalize sex, uh -huh. to push the most marginal people into more dangerous and more marginal situations. Mm -hmm. um, and it's really, really harmful. And let's fill up that pipeline of prison, because that's exactly what we need to do. You know, we, we, as a libertarian, I'm active in the Libertarian Party uh, locally and, and to a little, slightly degree nationally, we like to say that the most dangerous part of smoking weed is getting caught with it. Because who knows what's going right. to happen to you if, God forbid, you get caught with a plant. Um, by the way, I'll point out editorially, as I do at this moment in the conversation, that the Libertarian Party, which is qualified for the ballot in all 50 states in America, America's third largest political party with approximately, do I sound like an infomercial or what? Do I sound like a ShamWow guy? <laughs> but four and a half million people voted for our presidential candidate in 2016, which ain't big, but that's a one whole hell of a lot of people. We are the only political party in America that has adopted a pro-sex worker plank in our national, hard-coded into our national platform. All right? And we also have a national caucus committee based on supporting sex worker rights in every way or shape possible. So I would ask you, in fact, I'll get you some names you know, uh, you know, in the coming week or so, of some uh, libertarians in, in Pennsylvania who would do n like nothing better to help advance your cause, whether it be in Pittsburgh, Philly, or Dubois, uh, Pennsylvania. And yes, I've been to Dubois, Pennsylvania. All right, so, <laughs> so I, because that's how strongly we feel as libertarians about this issue. Questions of sexuality and consensual sex practices are between, between consulting adults need to stay exactly there between consenting adults. And if there's a commercial attachment to that, well, that's nobody's damn business. But quite frankly, well, the two adults. Uh, it's 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 right. it's, mm -hmm. it's it's really that simple. I, I you know, but you, well, and I th I think what the, another there's a there's an economic reality to this too, which is that one of the things that's so threatening about sex work is that it gives women and it gives marginalized people and LGBTQ folks access to capital. Yeah, <laughs> you know, you you free them from a dependency both on the state and now at these emerging not NGO not for profits who would seek to save us from ourselves. Uh, and, and you give right. them a level of economic independence that, you know, and I'll use, I'll drop the P word, the patriarchy, the, 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 that the patriarchy simply, seemingly can't abide by. They're, and they're willing to spend right. mm -hmm. billions of our dollars, not theirs, but our dollars, to prevent, again, normal human sexual interactions from taking place. Uh, Again, right, I, and it, it's it's interesting because I think that a lot of people like to think about sex work and why people are so offended or so um, turned off by sex work in terms of moral turn, like in terms of moral outrage or some sort of uh, puritanism or something like that. But I actually. Um, I think it's bigger than that. I think it's not just about sexual mores. I think it's also about women and minorities having access to, to capital and having independence and right. uh, the, the patriarchy, as you say, trying to prevent that from happening. Right. So now let, let's talk about some of the things that you're involved in in, in Pittsburgh. First of all, give us, uh, and, 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 and again, what I always tell people who come on the show is I want you to engage in 
incredible acts of self-promotion here. I, I want you to tell us, <laughs> well, uh, I, because, because that's the point of this show, is to find people who are doing great stuff and, and try to, to whatever degree possible, a, a local streaming television show can do in New England, is to promote what the work they do. Because the beauty of independent media is that the national media has found no way to control or harness us, despite their very best efforts. And in the aggregate, <laughs> in the aggregate, we're, we're working as, in the Libertarian Party, where one of the projects I'm involved in is bringing together all these varieties of Libertarian podcasts, streaming television shows, radio shows, websites, blogs, whatever, and try and promote a spirit of co cooperation so that we, we self-promote each other. We're not challenged by, you know, we don't see each other as competition. And we overall, we raise up the conversation on the ideas and issues that we care so much about, this being one of them. So tell me about your, your Peep Show podcast. I, I, first of all, how did you get that name? Because that's an outstanding name. And the fact that it was available in the last <laughs> couple of years, I mean, that's, that's, that's just, that, as someone who grew up right outside of New York City in the 70s, have you, have you seen that movie, on H, uh, the show on HBO? I, I, you know, that, yeah. That's the New York City I love and grew up in. Okay, <laughs> so you know, and I—that's all I'm gonna say. But the, um, you know, how, tell tell us about your podcast, where they can hear it, and give us give us an idea of the range of subjects you've covered recently and, and want to cover. Yeah, so we, um, I co-host this with my husband. We started it together, and uh, one of the reasons we started it actually is also connected to academia, interestingly. So I said earlier in the show that he was writing a dissertation on CAM modeling and going through an IRB process as an academic to do research is um, on like with, within a sex work community is a really like patronizing experience where the IRB thinks that sex workers can't make decisions for themselves about right. whether or not they should participate in uh, in this work, right? And so he was, the only way in which he could get his, do his work was to double anonymize everybody, which makes no sense for so many sex workers who are actually trying to promote their own brands and their own work and who wow. already decide, who already are public figures, mm -hmm. you know, because so many, many sex workers are public figures. Um, and so um, we, he was doing a lot of this work and saying like, this is, ridiculous for the people who I'm working with because it's not benefiting our community in any way. Like, he was feeling like the work that he was doing wasn't benefiting or uplifting any of the people that he was working with. And so um, we started talking about how we could actually take some of the work that he was doing and then I was also doing, like, in terms of freelance writing and like, more journalistic writing um, and create something where we had more freedom to uh, give space to sex worker voices. So a podcast we thought sounded like a good idea because not only could we have on whoever we wanted to and let them, you know, identify however they wanted to, but it's also in their own voice. You know, unlike writing where I edit out people's <laughs> comments and mediate it through my own uh, lens, when you have somebody on your show, they talk from their own voice about their own experiences. And um, so that was kind of where we were coming from, is that wouldn't it be great if we created something that we could have people who were doing really important work in sex work organizing and just sex workers in general, not just organizers, but um, to come on and tell their stories. So I think that a lot of the work, I mean, a lot of the work, despite this, except with the exception of the swap stuff, which is more directly political, um, a lot of my work has been in storytelling and letting people or giving people space to share their stories because I think that that's really powerful. It's really powerful in destigmatizing sex work to see that the people who are engaged in the sex industry are real people and not just sex workers but clients. We've also had clients of sex workers on to tell their stories and to talk about what they get out of the relationships that they have with their providers. Um, and so um, we, what we've done with the Peep Show podcast is, and, and that was actually going back to the name, um, that was one of the reasons why we wanted the name is we wanted to kind of signal that it's a glance into a world. Um, and we've had people from 
all aspects of sex work, from sex work organizers to full-service sex workers to people who've done survival sex work to cam girls and phone sex operators and dominatrixes and, mm-hmm. you know, people who work in various aspects of the industry on to talk about things that they deal with. We've talked about stigma. We've talked about art. We've talked about disability. You know, any, anything, and all of these things are intimately tied into to sex work. It's very it's deeply personal work. So we've done that, and we've also um, covered a lot of sex work events. So next week we're going to the Woodhall Sexual Freedom Summit to record interviews there. That's in Alexandria, Virginia. So we'll be there um, collecting audio from that event. And we've also gone to ABN a couple times. We've gone to Expos. We try to be at the places where, and also art shows in New York. We've come up to art shows in New York um, and hacking hustle, like hustling events um, to just kind of capture some of the spirit of the movement right now. So mm-hmm. that's what we've been mostly doing with the podcast. How well, and we, we had a situation here which was um, kind of, it was fascinating in one perspective. Re- very recently, um, there's a very strong strip club, club, adult club culture here in Providence, Rhode Island. I often mm-hmm. refer to uh, Providence as sort of the Las Vegas, if you will, of New England. You know, it, it's fascinating okay. because your impression of New England is probably highly puritanical, short of maybe not the Bible Belt. Uh, but we also know that the more puritanical, the, sometimes the more twisted people are. Um, but we had a... Uh, we had a, 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 a strip club here uh, raided, if you will, by the police and shut down. There were uh, allegations of prostitution happening out of it. Now, this club, the Foxy Lady, is, mm-hmm. is a, of the, in any city, there's a variety of strip clubs that probably represent different economic, economic stratas, for lack of a better term. You know, there's the high scale, you know, expensive ones and there's the more basic neighborhood ones we'll just leave it at that so right. mm-hmm. so what happened was you had and, and this is one of the challenges i think the movement has to face so you had allegations of prostitution and the dancers many of them were very public about uh and almost demeaning towards the young ladies who are alleged to have engaged in prostitution now Step aside from the fact that whether they were uh, whether they were um, guilt quote unquote guilty or not. Let's step right. aside from all of those issues. It, it displayed sort of a, uh, a a a fault line, if you will, in the what should be a unified approach. There were folks here in the sex worker community who reached out to folks who were dancers, and and this was a very powerful, very uh, influential nightclub, if you will, who just happened to have, right. ex- have to have exotic dancers. So, you know, this was, this employed hundreds of people. It, overnight, a few hundred people were essentially put out of work, uh, right, right yeah. as they were approaching the Christmas holidays. And, and it, it was terrible, just simply from a human perspective. People who were employed in Rhode Island, the, the employment situation is pretty challenged, were all of a sudden unemployed. And you, for a Two things happened. For a brief moment, you got to see the human face of people who worked in the sex industry. All of a sudden, people who couldn't meet their tuition bills at local colleges. All of a sudden, people who had to apply for public assistance because, you know, they had children. They, uh, there was, you know, as right. you would imagine, mm-hmm. single moms there. But at the same time, you had this sort of almost sneer, we're not prostitutes, we're not hookahs. And, and right. I, that was troubling to me. I mean, what, do you see that in other parts of the country? Um, wh- yeah, I mean, I see that everywhere. We we have um, like there's a there's a term in sex work called the hierarchy, you know, where <laughs> um, where workers um, of various sorts um, have you know are seen to be you know, better than other, you know, other ones. Mm -hmm. And so, and typically that has to do with how much contact there is with, you know, with clients. And so people who do more uh, contact are seen to be lower on the totem pole, unless you're a very, like, high-end escort, you know, which that they somehow, uh, you know, jump the system. But I think that um, with strip clubs it's actually complicated because, um and that, I think, plays out in, you know, I, I have to say that I've never worked in a strip club, but I've worked 
with a lot of strippers who have worked in strip clubs. So um, I can speak to what I've heard them say about this. Um, and what I've heard is that part of the reason that this exists is because um, for people who don't want to engage in full service work, they feel like if there are people there who are, it creates like pressure for them to do so. And the solution for most people, or I think the best solution to that <laughs> um, is to decriminalize sex work so that people who want right. to dance can dance and people who want to do full service work can do full full service work, you know, um, and that there isn't, you know, the sort of, uh, so that people who are working in clubs don't feel like they have to engage in that because there would be safe spaces for uh -huh. people to do full service work. But yeah, I mean, I think that that's always kind of existed within, within strip clubs. There's always been more that's happened in strip clubs. And then there's always been folks who feel like the fact that this happens in strip clubs and, uh, you know, puts them in a position of relative danger if they don't want to engage in that. Huh. Interesting, because it, it strikes me right now, particularly given the national pressures being placed on this and the continual conflation with adult work with quote unquote trafficking, that there needs to be a degree of unanimity more so than ever, given the challenges the sex work community has to getting any sort of support, either from the two national parties who, quite frankly, are e right. eager to pile on when or whenever possible. Um, you know, and, and, and it is shocking because on one level, the Democratic Party is a, it would like to associate itself and, and self-describes itself as, you know, being the party of, of sympathy and caring and emotion and support and, and women's rights, yet can't, you know, you've got Kamala Harris, who's running for the presidency of the United States, who is just god-awful on all those issues, yeah. blowing up, right. you know, I mean, uh, to, to a degree that's, that's still shocking. Um, and you, you've got this, this tension within feminism and within the, the greater political community, community at large. Part of it is follow the dollars, obviously. There's a lot of money, you know, coming down, down the pipe for people who want to posture as, as, as you know, as anti-trafficking folks. Now, you, 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 you also write for a paper. Now, how do you, again, you, this is very out. I mean, what are some of the, the subjects? Because I want, I want to make sure people have links so that they can read and, and follow you. What are some of the issues that you cover in terms of, uh, in terms of your writing? Wait, I'm sorry you cut out. I couldn't hear that. Oh, yeah. Question. No, in terms of you write for an alternative paper in, in Pittsburgh. What are some of the areas and some of the subjects that you cover? Yeah, so I have a weekly sex column, and it's, it's not sex work specific, except that they hired an out sex worker to write it, so that makes it kind of a sex work column um, in the sense that I'm writing from that positionality. I talk... I write every week, um, and it's in the Pittsburgh City Paper, which is the alt-weekly there, and I write about a lot of different things. I, some, I often write about sex work politics, um, mm -hmm. including things like anti-trafficking bills and um, local, local ones as well, um, so I'll cover that sort of stuff, but then I also cover sexuality more generally. Um, one of the things that I try to do in my column is bring in sex worker voices, even when it's about things that just have to do with sex. Because if you go back to what we were saying earlier, I think sex workers know, you know, are experts on sex. They know a great deal about sex. So mm -hmm. even when I'm, you know, I talk about sex work politics. I also talk about um, dating and sex in general. I talk about um, alternative sexual lifestyles. Like last week I talked about going to swinger clubs and th things that you should think about going into swinger clubs. This week I've talked about demisexuality and what demisexuality is, and um, I'll talk about everything from um, BDSM to, mm -hmm. <laughs> to swinging to vanilla sex to negotiating open relationships with your partner to, you know, anything, mm -hmm. anything that's, you know, sex related mm -hmm. and love related and dating related. Um, and... I often I'll speak from my own perspective, but I also interview folks for a lot of those pieces. And often um, I interview sex workers. So, like for example, the piece that I wrote for next that's coming out next week on demi sexuality is uh, I interviewed three people: one's a graduate student, one's a dominatrix, and one is a porn star. So, 
none of it had to do with sex work in particular, but I brought in voices of sex workers to Mm -hmm. talk about their experiences and how they negotiate their own sexuality. Because the other issue, of course, is you've got a personal life and you've got a professional life. And and, and how, how, you know, navigating those two, obviously... It, uh, is, is a direct function of your partner or partners um, in, right. in, in, in their willingness to ne- navigate it with you. But, you know, in, 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 in times like these, how important is it, is it to have a, a support network and or a partner network or individual partner that's supportive of this? I, I, I you know, I can't imagine the challenges to a relationship that this could present if, if at any level it became toxic. I just, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's tough for someone from an older generation. Yeah, I mean, I think it's really important, and I think it's really important because, like, sex work discrimination against sex workers is getting more intense all the time. It's not getting better. So banking, like, sex workers have their bank accounts shut down. They have their social media accounts shut down. They have, you know, we experience a lot of things that the general population doesn't have to deal with or doesn't have to experience. And so I do think that it's nice if you have a partner who can understand, like, what those sort of challenges and stresses are and who also, like, there's also things that sex workers think about that the general population doesn't think about, Um, like not having your kids on social media or not having social media that would link your sex work identity to your home address, for example. And so having a partner that understands how to negotiate those uh, that lifestyle because it is different. Um, mm-hmm. You know, I take, I and every other sex worker that I know takes precautions in terms of security that other people just don't take. And so, um, and on top of that, the fact that we live in a world in which we're always doing that also means that, you know, that's that's fairly stressful. <laughs> so to have somebody that understands that, that stress, um, I think is is important. Um, but, you know, that's not all sex workers are partnered and not all sex workers who are partnered have, you know, sex worker partners. Um, but I think that having people who under, like, can at least, understand the fact what you do as a job and what sort of special um, considerations you have to take because of that job. I think that's important. Well, I mean, one only need to look at an increasingly digital world and then imagine one day waking up and having your digital assets be, be re- removed from you by an act, literally an act of Congress. I, you know, the, on, on an anecdotal level, of course, because so much of it now is anecdotal, because God forbid the government that inflicts these laws on people should actually track the impact of it. But imagine, you know, if you're receiving electronic payments through PayPal in particular, uh, or any one of the other, you know, you know, Venmos of the world, then all of a sudden finding one day that, well, that money's gone. <laughs> you know. No, that's not even, I mean, that's not even anecdotal. That happens all the time. And right. not only does that happen, but those platforms seize funds and they do not give them back. Right. You know, so sex workers' accounts get shut down all the time and we lose all of our money. Like, that's just something that, that happens. Um, sex workers, many sex workers are banned from platforms like Airbnb, even if they've never done sex work out of an Airbnb. Um, They just can't use them by virtue of the fact that they've been sex workers or they are sex workers. Um, You know, and shadow banning right now on social media platforms is a really big thing. Sex workers are being pushed off social media or they're being silenced, and that's impacting our ability to connect with each other. to connect with each other and to organize and you know when communities are are lost and people lose their accounts it's really hard to rebuild that um so all of that it all of that is something that sex workers are dealing with constantly and which has been getting worse since the passage of fosta sesta um yeah and and and, and so in every single way imaginable is it an exaggeration to say that sex workers are under t- attack by a society that effectively, at, simultaneously, craves their existence? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I do. I feel, I feel that. I feel like sex workers are under attack. Um, yeah, and the thing that's so like 
mind-boggling about this is the reason that sex workers exist is because there's a demand for them. Right. You know, so it's it's this very strange uh, walk between, like, being um, desired and being, like, simultaneously, like, pushed off of every public space. Right. Do you find, and in, 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 I know you want to come in, I appreciate you spending all this time with me on a Friday night. Um, <laughs> is the political network in Pennsylvania at all accommodating? Are they supportive? Have you found any uh, bastions of hope, bright lights out there with you in areas like Pittsburgh or, or Western Pennsylvania? Yeah, I mean, I have to say that um, while our while our DA um, is terrible um, in Pittsburgh in particular, but um, the DA in Philadelphia is really great, and the organizations that have partnered with us have been, like, really, really supportive of sex worker rights. So, like I said before, the local um, ACLU, the ACLU of Western Pennsylvania, has been behind us. Planned Parenthood has been behind us. There's other, like, uh, or trans organizations that have been really, really helpful. And I have to say, like, you know, I do write my column, I write my column in a mainstream newspaper, and they brought me on in part because I am a sex worker um, and can speak from that experience. So I feel like there is there are places where, or there is a lot of hope in the sense that there are people who, there are individual people and there are organizations who um, want to stand behind sex workers, even, and are, um, supportive of the work that sex workers and sex worker organizers are doing, um, even while, like, from a top-down perspective, it's it's pretty awful. Well, I, I, again, I want to thank you for taking the time to join me tonight. Um, I really appreciate your, your perspective, um, the kind of introspective look you're willing to take seemingly on a routine basis here uh, is really remarkable. Uh, and that, that speaks to an intelligence and a resilience as well because, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, and it, it's an issue that folks want to talk about. Sadly, it doesn't seem like an issue that at least the mainstream media or mainstream Washington or mainstream, you know, pick your local government wants to really do anything about. And, and that's, right. you know, mm -hmm. as, as we announced yet another or discovered another murder today, and I think it's something like 14 nationwide this year of, of, of trans sex workers of color murdered again and, right. and, and, and in a different uh, legal community who uh, is willing to have numbers and statistics conflated at will without any objection uh, and who is willing to, just because of uh, political expediency, uh, willing to continue to pursue an issue that virtually doesn't exist because of the that what accrues to the bottom line of their governmental organization. Um, it's, it, these are just difficult times. And in an age when we're yeah. allegedly we've matured as a society, it's clear, it's clear, clear we haven't. So give us, give us a roundup again. Right. Where can, where can find, folks find Jesse Sage? Give us a complete list. Uh, I am, mostly I'm on Twitter. I'm on Twitter a lot at sapiotextual. And I also have a website where you can find my writing at jessiesage.com. Um, and um, you can find me on Nightflirt, um, on under Jesse Sage, lots of different places. Right. Well, well, again, thank you so much. Best of luck. And please, we always say this. And yeah, some thank you for having me on. It was really nice to chat with you. Yeah, some folks take advantage of some folks don't. If you're particular, if you find yourself anywhere in the Northeast, please let us know. Please make it up to New England sometime soon and give a talk to any one of the groups, groups like SWAN and SWAP and, you know, uh, and, and in particularly yeah. in Rhode Island, Coyote, with uh, with with our good friend Bella, uh, let us know and just yeah. keep us keep us in the loop as to what you're doing. Because again, if imagine a world where every independent media outlet just got together, picked out some critical issues like decrim and crit critical issues like the war on drugs and regressive taxation, and just decided, you know what, we're just going to go balls to the wall and we're going to support activists in that. Then you know what? Guess what? We're, we, we're louder than CNN. We're louder than whatever. <laughs> idiot Hollywood type has decided to wage a war on trafficking. We're louder than any of them if we could only find a way for all of us to get at least loosely on the same page. So right. thank you very, very much. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for having me on. And we'll talk
soon, I hope. Jesse Sage, of course. Okay, bye. JesseSage.com and a list of sites that we'll make available to you. We are the coalition. We are, as always, loud and proud, outrage porn free, civilly disobedient media broadcasting live on the worldwide coalition network here at the Go Local Live Broadcast Center, deep in the heart of the city we love, Providence, Rhode Island, the naked city, the city of well, hundreds of thousands of stories. Facebook.com slash the Coalition Radio on the Mighty Mighty Twitter at Coalition underscore radio. And of course, coalitionradio.us where you can find links to our podcast site, our links to our YouTube page. If you're listening to this show for the very first time or you catch us somewhere out there in the great white world of, of media, a wide world it is, please take a moment to like us and follow us. Social media, of course, is the currency of independent media. Without that, we simply don't have the, the power, the oomph to reach out to people and spread our message. Our Facebook likes are way up, as does our Twitter followers, and we thank you for taking the time. We're going we're gonna to take a few minute break. I think I'm getting a little issue connecting with our 7 o'clock guests. Of course, that's a coalition time. It's already 7.20, so we might juggle the lineup a little bit. Folks, stay tuned. We'll be back in just a few minutes.